Let me ask another question. Uh, this is based on a quote from C.S. Lewis, which I've heard often uh, when it comes to suffering. He, he wrote in, in his book, The Problem of Pain, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Now, I can understand why Lewis made the statement, and it certainly seems to imply that somehow God's love is reaching out to us in and through illness, reaching down to us in order to, to somehow get their attention uh, to, I, I would assume, a, a, loving, a loving, benevolent God uh, in and through the illness. But there are a number of instances in which to say this to someone in their suffering, or maybe even to think that this way of approaching illness or explaining it, um, it, it strikes me as potentially being awful. And I want to just give three examples. Uh, first, consider Ryder, a four-year-old boy with DIPG, which is an inoperable brain cancer. He will likely die in 12 to 16 months. He lives in Orlando, Florida. In what way can illness be a megaphone to him? Or consider HO, a 27-year-old female with borderline personality disorder, which is a serious mental illness characterized per by pervasive instability in moods, instability in relationships, uh, self-image, poor self-image and behavior. Um, HO, HO had recurrent suicidal behavior, self-mutilating -mutila behavior like cutting and pulling out her hair. And, and she wrote in her blog uh, these words, I cut because pain of being borderline is so intense and so unbearable that the little kick of endorphins in reaction to acute physical pain is the only thing that brings relief from this horrific mental pain. How bad would you have to feel, she writes, to want it, to kill yourself? I feel like it most of the time. Sometimes I prefer I had cancer instead. At least then the whole world would not blame me for desperate efforts to blunt the pain brought about by my biological vulnerability and abuse I suffered as a child. And what's striking to me about certain types of mental illnesses is that it, it afflicts the person. It strikes them at their very emotional and rational states. How can that be a megaphone? Third example, consider Kelly, a 74-year-old female with severe dementia. She no longer regularly recognizes her daughters, and despite having grown up and for most of her life being deeply faithful from childhood, she has forgotten God. How can these types of illnesses be claimed to encourage a person to seek God? Is this God's megaphone? How can one claim that God is loving in God's providence when he allows this level of affliction to the person? How is God loving to Ryder or H.O. or to Kelly in these bitter sufferings? How can you as a Christian scholar, intellectually claim that God's intention is love in these types of cases? With great difficulty. And I mean that sincerely, ladies and gentlemen. I think Lewis had a point, but he wasn't right in the absolute sense. Much as I, I used to listen to C.S. Lewis many years ago, and he's taught me a lot. But I think within the context in which he intended it, he was right. But the examples you give, it's not a megaphone. I agree with your verdict. It's awful. And so how do we begin to come to terms with it? Let's start at the other end. Pain is enormously important. I'm glad that I have nerves so that when I stick my hand into the fire by accident, it tells me that something's going wrong. And um, I notice that even ball players in this country have nerves, and sometimes they're not very pleased with them, but they do tell you when you need a bit of uh, chiropractic or something done in your back to make you fit for the next season. So pain has a very practical, and you all know that. You don't need me to tell you that as medics. That's absurd. I shouldn't even have said it. But uh, pain is very important. Uh, we are equipped with nerves that give us pain. That's the interesting thing. And they are 
vastly important to the way in which we live and, and so on. What troubles me about these things and troubles anybody, including you, who thinks about them is it seems so out of proportion, doesn't it? Just so out of proportion. Now, we can go one of two ways, as I said before, but what, what you're raising now is the problem of natural evil. And there's a sense in which we can understand, though not completely, people that walk into a classroom and shoot people to death and so on. We can see it's moral evil and we can blame X for doing it. But when it comes to tsunami or these horrific diseases that you mention, you can't blame a person for it. So you say, okay, well, blame God for it because after all, if this is God's universe, he is ultimately responsible. And that's true, absolutely true. You can't, I can't avoid that. I just cannot avoid that point. There's no philosophical sophistry that gets you around that. So here's what I'm faced with. Those mechanisms that normally are very useful and healthy for us in our bodies, those mechanisms that give us pain, the response in the brain, and so on. When something goes very badly wrong and everything just goes viral, to use the, the, the current word, and the pain is inordinate and unacceptable and has to be dealt with by fairly serious doses of palliative care and all this kind of thing, we can alleviate pain. And I'd like to say something because you mentioned that you were in the palliative care interest side of things. I have been so impressed at palliative doctors that I've got to know who are in the business of trying to alleviate some of that pain, or not all of it. So we're faced with what appears to be an intractable problem. And I just want to come to briefly. I don't have a solution to it for the simple reason that we've lived with this after all, we lived for centuries without anesthetics. I, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't like the dentist much. Um, and I, I have a little theory that there are only two kinds of people in the world. People who, like, uh, people who don't like dentists and liars. But that's another matter. <laughs> I think of the centuries where people believed in God in millions and there were no anesthetics. I mean, that is just a no palliative care, nothing. That's almost unbelievable to me, but it did happen. It's not proof of anything. It's, it's just a fact historically. So let me come to the heart of this as I see it. And, and you can think about this. I have no simplistic solutions. I wouldn't insult you by having a simplistic solution. But my approach to it in a way is, is this, that I'm faced with beauty, as I said, and the wonderful potentiality and capacity of medicine to affect a cure. Now I sit here, and I'm sitting in this room because of medical intervention at the last second of my life. So I know what that means. A cardiac surgeon saved my life, and I wasn't expected to live, no hope whatsoever. So I'm sitting here. And people say, well, thank God for that. I said, be careful. Because in the very same few weeks that that happened to me, my sister's daughter of 22 was carried away by a massive brain tumor. And she didn't get cured. Now, how do I cope with that? Well, I see it like this. If you reject God, I'll understand you. To a sense. Because you just say, there isn't a God, forget it. The universe is like it is, it's bleak. For some people it goes well, but for the vast majority it's pretty horrible. And certainly for the vast majority of people who've ever lived. But there the suffering remains. And now that little boy, who's got this disease that's going to kill him in a few weeks. He, nothing, the end, nothing. Atheism has nothing to say to him that's positive. Now, what can I say to the young mother of cancer that's going to die in a few weeks? I can't cure her cancer, it's inoperable, and so on. But you see, let me put it this way. You know, probably, many of you, that at the heart of Christianity there is a cross. 
And since I can't solve the philosophical problem, why a good God allows this level of suffering, I ask another question, and I asked it before in my talk. Now I'm going to come to how I reflect on it. And that is, granted that it's messy, granted, let me put it this way, this world is full of two things, beauty and barbed wire. Is there any evidence anywhere that there is a God you could trust with it ultimately? Now, the heart, and the main reason I'm a Christian, is because the heart of Christianity, there's a cross. And on it, Jesus died, as you know. But the big thing is that he claimed to be God. God encoded in humanity. Do I believe it? Yes, I do. As a scientist, yes, I do. But that's another story. So the question in this context is, what is God doing on a cross? And my answer to that is, it shows me at the very least that God has not remained distant from the problem of human suffering, but has himself become part of it. Now, at the pragmatic level, I've seen that bring healing to many, many people. If they begin to see that God actually understands our suffering, you know, often when you're standing along somebody who's suffering, you'll know as doctors that if they're weeping and you weep too, you, you have far bigger effect than if you take out a stethoscope and give them more antibiotics because they're looking for somebody that understands. Now, you see, ladies and gentlemen, let me go one step further. If that was the end of it, it would be nothing. But the God that suffered on the cross rose from the dead. And that opens up a whole world of possibility. It opens up at the level of moral evil, not only the possibility, but to my mind, the certainty that there's going to be a final judgment, that terrorists are not going to get away with it, that the bombers of 9-11 are going to face it. That is what backs up your conscience and tells me that it's not an illusion, that morality is not an illusion because it's got a backup. But secondly, I do believe as I sit here that God is a God of compensation. Does I think of that little boy and think of my own grandchildren and think of children I, I have known who have suffered to death with these degenerative diseases. Now, this is, a, this is a big thing to say, but I'm going to say it to you as medics. I believe firmly that if you could see what God has done with people like that ultimately, your questions would stop. That's what I believe but it depends crucially on the fact that there's someone in space, time, and history who's suffered and risen from the dead. Atheism doesn't have that. It is nothing. And you see that 22-year-old niece of mine with her brain tumor, and I sat with her. She knew she was going to die. As she neared death, her confidence in God increased because she knew where she was going. She had real hope. I've watched atheists die, and they don't have that hope. And you see, that goes back, Michael, to your earlier point of those statistics. People who are secure tend to be less religious. But you see, a statistical analysis of a group of people who are secure at the moment, if you're sitting there feeling secure financially and you lose all your money tomorrow, you're not secure anymore. Or you lose your health tomorrow. That may be true at a given stage because we, life hasn't hit us in reality and we feel wonderful. We're like people sitting on a beach enjoying the sun and somebody up on the cliff can see that the tide's coming in. It's all around us. We feel terrific. We feel secure. But actually, we need saving desperately, although we don't see it. So that's how, sorry to take so long about that, but it's such a big thing. And it's not an answer in the sense of, oh, well, that's it, X plus Y equals Z, therefore we're all solved. No. But you see, for me, ladies and gentlemen, my Christian faith is not an abstract belief in a theory. It's a living relationship with a person. And it's that relationship that I take into all these engagements and talking to people. And I arrived in Christ Church, I'll finish with this, Two days after the earthquake hit, I had to speak at the biggest church gathering I had in many years, and sitting in front of me 
where people had lost their husbands because a wall fell on them in their office. And people that felt guilty because the wall fell on their colleague and didn't fall on them. This awful, terrible mess. And I spoke along the lines I've spoken to you. And one of the most moving things to me was a letter I got from a lady who lost her husband. She said, I couldn't stay to see the people. But she said, I just want you to know that in what you said about Christ, the cross, and the resurrection, I see the first glimmer of hope. 